Hey you doing everyone? Greetings and welcome back to the basement. So what I've got open here in front of me is XROR and on it I'm after filling up the screen with a load of little hellos and well it looks crashed doesn't it? The cursor isn't blinking down the bottom or anything but actually it's not. What it's doing is it's running a little piece of assembly language code that I've written because I wanted to try and write myself a little platform game. And what I'm doing at the moment is I'm testing to see if my ideas for game logic actually work or not. So what I've done is I've written a program in assembly language that doesn't change screen modes or clears screen or anything. And that way I can actually tap in text that'll make little platforms for me. And my code when run puts a little amphorand that you see here on top left hand side of the screen. And I can move it from the left to the right, or from the right to the left, I can move it left and right. And as long as it's over a character, more or less, it'll stay where it is. If it goes over a blank space, well then it'll fall. So this is kind of very rudimentary, basic, platformery logic. And I've also put in a little jump routine that'll let him kind of jump across the words, so as to speak. But it's more or less a piece of test code, but I taught you might be interested to see how it works. So I'll give you a little run through of it. Okay, so here in front of me on screen, I've got all the code that's needed to run that little platformer thingy that I was showing you. And I've kind of cheated in a way. There's a few little shortcuts I've taken. I haven't set up any kind of screen modes or anything. I haven't cleared the screen. We're using what's on the screen already as our platform. So we're only kind of dealing with pure game logic. Now I have added in a few little kind of extra bits and pieces. For example, when I move around on screen, I'm not actually erasing the, uh, the letters or the characters that I move over. You'll see that disc remains there, even though I've written the amphorand across it. And the reason that that's working is we need to do a few little extra things. We're not just blindly writing the little amphorand symbol to a byte. What we need to do first is we need to save what was in that byte before and then write our amphorand to it. And then when we move the amphorand on, we write back in what was there before, before we write the amphorand to the next, um, to the next memory location. So basically right here, I am at hex address 400. That's the very first byte of our screen buffer. That's where you see the amphorand top left hand side of the screen. And when I move it across here to the eye, I am moving into hex address 401. So before that little amphorand is written to hex address 401, the eye is saved to the B register in the processor, and then the amphorand is written. So that when I move to another location, that I can be written back. That's basically what's happening there. Now, all the time that this program is running as well, there is a fall routine that's been checked or that's been run to true to see if the byte directly below our amphorand is an empty space or not. If it's not an empty space, well then the fall routine doesn't actually do anything. It just moves on to check the keyboard to see if the player wants to go left, right or jump. If there is a blank space, then it'll call it, it'll cause the amphorand to fall down or it'll move it down one byte. So with that stuff in mind, we'll go back to our code and have a little look through it. So as always, I start my programs at hex address 3000 because it's kind of in user memory and we're not gonna screw anything up by doing it that way. So it's a kind of a safe thing to do. What I've done as well to try and make program writing easier for me is I've used the equate directive. And the reason I've done that is you can give kind of Englishy words, um, you can use them in place of values as you're writing your code and it makes things easier. So if you have an awful lot of values, it's kind of hard to remember what each one does. So you can assign each one a kind of an Englishy word that, um, that you can use in place of that value. So for example, the ASCII symbol for a blank space on the cocoa that we'll be checking for an awful lot is hex 60. So instead of writing in hex 60 right away down, down through the code, I have equated hex 60 to blank. So I can type in blank in place of the hex 60 and the compiler will know to use that in place. Just makes writing these things easier. I've done the same thing for player, that's our player character, the amphorand is zero. So I've assigned player with 
zero. So anywhere I write in player, it knows I'm talking about a zero. The other thing I've done is I've set up one little variable and I've called it direction. And the reason I've done that is that when we move to the left or the right, the direction variable will store either the value one or two. And yeah, it'll store the one if we move to the left, it'll store two if we move to the right. And when we do a jump, we can check that variable to see what information is in it. If it's a one, it'll make a jump to the left. If it's a two, it'll make a jump to the right. So that's pretty much what I've done there. Now, I'll just say that I have used an RMB directive in order to set up this variable. And that stands for, as far as I can tell, reserve a, a byte in memory uh, for whatever variable it is you want and you give a number afterwards which is however many bytes you want to reserve so we're only reserving one byte in memory for this little direction variable and thanks dave from coco town for this because the way i was doing this before i was just assigning kind of memory values willy-nilly and it's really not the way to do it so if you watched last episode and you saw the way i kind of set up a variable don't do it that way use this rmb thingy anyway that put aside. What we're doing is we're starting. This here is the point from where our program will start when first run. Into the A registry on the processor, we're sticking player, which is the value zero. So that's our ASCII code for an amphorand. And we're setting the X register to point to hex address 400. That's the top left hand side of the screen, the very beginning of the screen buffer. And what we're doing then is we're loading B with whatever is in X. You remember I said we needed to kind of save the letter or the character that was already there so that when we moved our amphorand across, we could write it back and we wouldn't overwrite what was on screen. That's what we're doing here. What happens then, we jump into this fall routine, which will be running right away throughout the code because it's constantly check and see, do I need to make the character fall? It's a bit like in real life, gravity is ever present. And this fall routine is more or less our digital gravity, more or less, that's what this is. So our fall routine, what it does is it stores A into X. So that's our amphorand placed on screen somewhere. And then what we want to do is we want to check the, the byte directly below the amphorand to see is it blank space or not. So the way we do that is we use the Y registry or the Y register inside in the processor. Now X is pointing to where the amphorand is. What we do is we add 32 to X and we store that to Y. That's what this command here is doing. It is loading the effective address X plus 32 and it's sticking it into Y. That's what that means. And what it does is it pretty much causes Y to point to the byte directly below where the amphorand is because the cocoa screen, each line on it is composed of 32 bytes. So if you move 32 bytes forward from somewhere, you will be directly below that somewhere. If you move 32 bytes backwards from somewhere, you'll be directly above that somewhere, if that makes sense to you. So now that we have Y pointing to the byte directly below the amphorand, what we do is we store the value there that Y is pointing to into the A registry and we compare it to hex 60 to see is it a blank space or not. That's how we check to see if the amphorand is over a blank space or not. Now, after this compare is done, if it's not equal to 60, that means it's not over a blank space, so it's standing on a character, then it doesn't do anything. It jumps straight to the keyboard routine and checks to see if the player wants to go to the left, to the right, or to jump. However, if it is over a blank space, what it does is it will load A with the player character, because remember, we already put in A whatever value was directly below it. So a blank space, for example, in this case, and it will store whatever is in X back to B. So the character that it saved out originally will be put back, you know, the character that was there before the amphorand. What it does then is it moves the X pointer on 32. So it kind of moves the X pointer to just below where the amphorand was placed originally. And it will store whatever value is there to the B register so it can write it back again. And then it will store A, which is our amphorand, into X. So effectively what it does 
is the byte directly below, which would be a blank space if it's fallen. That blank space information, the hex 60 will be stored to B and the amphorand will be placed there. And then it'll go through the check again. So we're, we're kind of constantly remember what was there, write an amphorand to it and kind of replace whatever was where the amphorand was before. If any of that makes sense to you. But that's, that's basically what's happening there. And then we pause. We pause and we do the check again. And what that does is it kind of fluidly makes our little amphorand fall down the screen. So it'll do the check, move it down a bite. It'll pause a little bit, do the check and move down a bite and so on. Because if there is no pause there, it'll do it lightning fast and you go from top of the screen to the bottom without even knowing what happened. There's no kind of fluidity in there. But that is our fall routine. Um, our keyboard routine then is something that's constantly run through as well. And what our keyboard routine is using is the polecat, the polecat ROM routine, which lives at hex address 8000. And the way that works is in our code, we jump to a place in ROM, which is actually hex address 8000. And there is a keyboard routine that was written there years and years and years ago by Tandy engineers when they were writing the actual ROM code for the Tandy. And what we're doing is we're pretty much borrowing that code for our own purposes. And what it does is it scans the keyboard. And if a key is pressed, it'll put the ASCII symbol for that key into the A register. And then what we can do is we can check and see what's in the A register. And if it equals uh, one of the keys that we want to be pressed, we can make it do something. So for example, when it comes back from the polecat routine, if the A register contains hex 31, we know that the one key has been pressed and we can compare for that. There we're comparing to see if the A register contains hex 31. If it does, if it's equal, then branch to the left routine. If it's not, it'll move on and it'll check for the next and next and next. And that way we can check and see what keys have been pressed. So for example, if a one has been pressed, it'll move down to left here. The left routine makes our little amphorand move one space to the left. But before it does that, what it does is it stores a one into the direction variable so that we can remember what direction we moved in last. That'll help us with the jump routine later on. But actually the way this works, it's very simple. Like there's only four or five lines of code, but it can get very complicated very quickly. Basically what we're doing is, we're going to move our amphorand one space to the left and it's on screen. So what we want to do is we want to take our amphorand out. We want to replace it with what was on the screen previously before we stuck it there in the first place. So the value that's in the B registry. Then we want to move our X pointer one space to the left. And we want to put whatever value is found there into our B registry for later on and then we write our amphorand in. That's basically what we're doing here. So what we do is we load A with the ASCII symbol on a cocoa for an amphorand. That's what we're doing here. Then we store B to X. What we're doing there is we are replacing the value that was there previously from the B registry. We're putting that back on the screen. Then we are moving our X pointer one space to the left. We are saving by loading B with whatever value is found there. We're putting that aside for later on. And then we are storing our amphorand into X. That's basically what we're doing. And that will achieve all in those commands, putting what was previously on screen back and moving our little amphorand one space to the left. That's basically what happens. And then what we do is we branch back to our fall routine to see is our amphorand now standing over an empty space or not. And the right routine works in exactly the same way. The only difference is we're writing a two into the direction variable so that we know we've moved to the right last. That's pretty much it. And finally, if the player presses the space bar, it will take them to the jump up routine. And the jump up routine is just a set of jump to subroutine instructions that'll take it to the jump routine. So basically what it'll do is it'll execute the jump routine 
three times. To make our little bite, jump up three spaces. That's pretty much it. So the jump routine, basically what it's doing is, it's working in the same way as kind of a mix between the fall routine in that it will check to see if the bite just above the amphorand is a space, you know, if it's a free space and not a character. And if that, that is the case, then it can jump. If it's a character, it'll branch back to the fall routine. There's no jump can take place if there is a character above the amphorand's head, more or less. And uh, it does that in the same way as the fall routine checks below to see if there's a space, only instead of moving uh, forward 32 bytes, it moves back 32 bytes to check the bite above it. So if the jump is on, if there is a space, then it does pretty much exactly the same thing as the moving to the left or the right routine would do, only instead of moving like minus one or, or plus one bytes to place the amphorand, it'll actually move minus 31 or minus 33 bytes. So it'll do kind of a jump diagonal left or right, depending on the last direction that the player has moved, more or less. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. That's the way our jump is working. Once the jump is finished, we go back to the full routine. And if the little character isn't above, or if the little amphorand isn't above like a character, it'll fall down. So that's pretty much it. That is our code. And uh, I've put in a little end, little end directive here to tell it where to start more or less in the code when execute is typed. So it'll start at start point, which is up here where it sets up, um, where it sets up these three things before it actually runs the first fall cycle more or less. But that's it. That is more or less the test code. Now, I know that um, this stuff is kind of complicated. It is. And it takes a little bit of kind of getting your head around. I know that as well. And I wouldn't be the greatest in the universe at explaining it either. I'll be absolutely honest with you. But um, what I would like to do is I would like to throw some kind of a little series together where I can maybe start at the very beginnings. And if you're interested at all in learning this stuff, it may be of help to you. And kind of to aid in that as well, I don't know if you're aware or not, but I wrote a little game called Simoko, which is a little bit like the Simon Colored Memory game from back in the 70s. And I'll put a link in the description as where you can download that. But it comes with the source code fully documented and commented and whatnot. So that may be of help to you as well if you're trying to figure out this stuff. But anyway, that is um, that is pretty much that. I hope this has been in some way useful to you. And until the next episode where I'll be doing more sound stuff, we'll talk to you soon. Take good care of yourselves. Bye-bye.